All right, I think we're going to get started in a second. If somebody listening can just type into their chat pane that they can hear me, I'll start the presentation once I know that if the audio is good. Anybody? Okay, looking good. Give me a second, I'll put up the PowerPoint and we'll move right along. All right, real quick, can you see the PowerPoint? Anybody? Okay, looking good. All right, so welcome to this month's webinar, the Making Law Group's monthly series, How to Divorce Proof Your Business. I want to thank you all for coming. I know it's, at least around me, it's not the best weather, although it's nice and warm for December, but it's rainy, so hopefully you're sitting comfortably somewhere and just listening to this. Let's jump right into giving you some information about what to expect and how we're going to proceed tonight. This webinar, like all of our webinars, is scheduled for one hour. Um, I never know how long something's going to take. I do my best to uh, stay on track with the time, but sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. Uh, I try not to keep more than an hour so that if you have other plans, you don't miss anything. Um, this is a one-way communication, so you should be able to hear me throughout, um, but I would not be able to hear you. Um, I do want to take questions, however, so you'll see there is a panel, should be on the right side of your screen, and there's a pull-down for questions. As we go through the webinar, type your questions right into that so that you don't forget it or miss it while we go through other things. I'm going to take as much time as I can at the end to answer any questions, but I usually don't stop during the um, webinar to take them. For those that have not met or worked with me, and that's the majority of people who normally attend my webinars, my name is Brad Micklin. I'm the managing member of the Micklin Law Group. Uh, I am licensed to appear in uh, New Jersey and New York both in state and federal courts. I started my law career about 20 years ago, serving as the judicial law clerk to Eugene Austin, who at the time was the supervising judge of the special civil division or special civil part in the Bergen County Superior Court. From there, I went to Kessler and Associates. I did complex commercial litigation for a number of years. I liked the litigation, but I found that I didn't care much for representing businesses. I like to deal more with people. So I left Kessler's office and opened my own office, and I think it was 2001. It was 2000, 2000 or 2001. Uh, when I first opened, I was a general practice attorney, and I quickly learned that you can't be good at everything. So I concentrated my practice into divorce, family law, and estate planning and litigation. The Maitland Law Group, which was formed several years after, um, we brought in a few associates, and we still hold the same concentration, divorce, family law, and estate planning and litigation. I tend to handle more of the high conflict, high net worth cases, but our focus is on those four broad areas. Some background on me. I do this in my webinars, not so that I can sound impressive, but um, many of you may come to work with me in the future. Some of you have maybe looked at my site or even consulted with me and you're contemplating whether or not you want to go forward. I say it a lot of people that I meet. You don't know if you have a bad lawyer until afterwards most of the time, so it's good to do research. This is just some of the awards I received on the left side of the most recent ones from the American Academy of Trial Attorneys, National Association of Distinguished Counsel, and the National Advocates Top 100 Lawyers. The ones on the right side are um, legal-based programs. Um, the right is a client distinction I received from Martin Hubble, one of the largest legal online researching companies, I think, in the world. Um, I've received that a number of years running, as well as the um, AVO Excellent Rated Attorney down on your bottom right. But enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be here discussing later. But first, let me tell you what we're not going to be discussing. I don't want anybody to be misled by the title. This is not going to be anything about divorce planning. It's not anything about hiding assets or minimizing the value of a business or the value of assets that not only is not condoned, but if you try to do it, it will adversely 
affect and impact your case and your credibility. It is probably the first thing that a divorce court judge will look to when a small business is involved, especially if there's claims of depressed income or earnings in recent years. So clearly not going to discuss or try to assist in anything like that. So let's now talk about what we will talk about. First is equitable distribution factors. Equitable distribution, as we'll cover, is how assets and debts are divorced. Uh, uh, divorced, are divided in a divorce case. We're going to talk about pre- and post-marital assets. We're going to talk about active and passive distinctions of assets. Now, those four um, classifications or groups are not separate and apart. They're sort of overlapping. Um, They're sort of separate or sort of together, but they overlap and, and many change. So we're going to talk about how to identify and um, safeguard as well as divide all of those Second is going to be alimony factors. We'll probably spend a good amount of time discussing alimony. One, there are uh, several factors to our current alimony statute, and all of them will have some impact on your cases, so it's good to at least be familiar with them. We're going to talk about the difficulty with cash businesses, both in and out of court. Um, perks as income, you know, the benefits and detriments to how that is done. Um, imputed income, and that's going to be on both sides of this fence, um, both the business owner as well as the, the either supported spouse or their lower earning spouse. We're going to talk about Social Security offsets, something that doesn't often come up in divorce cases, and I think mostly to the client's detriment. It's, it's something that I spend a, a great deal of time focusing on, but I, I haven't seen in many other attorneys in many other cases, so it's important to be familiar with this. Future modifications, a very significant issue if you own a business and you're going to have alimony or child support obligations. So we'll go through the standard for that as well as um, what you need to watch for and, and how to possibly protect yourself. Lack of marketability discount. Um, there's a note here, it's implied in extraordinary circumstances. That's what we're going to talk about because unfortunately the current state of the law in New Jersey divides the value of a business in a divorce very differently than it would in other areas of law. And in other areas of law, it's done in a common sensical method and unfortunately not in divorces. So it's important to know what's going to happen because it can cause a significant hardship if you're unfamiliar. Fourth, I apologize. The picture on the screen is, is overlapping the words. Issues and concerns. Um, we're going to talk about um, just different issues and, and concerns that come up as far as how to plan before and after your marriage to possibly reduce or eliminate some of the difficulties that can arise from having your own business and going through a divorce. That being said, we're going to turn our attention first to equitable, distri equitable distribution factors. Again, equitable distribution is the method in which assets and debts are divided in a divorce. Um, here I put a note, generally division of parties' assets and debts are 50% to each party. Now, it's important to remember that it's equitable distribution. It's not equal distribution. And there's a reason that it's not equal distribution. Um, there are a lot of factors that can and should be considered when distributing assets and debts. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people do consider them. But there's a reason that we have these factors. So while it's commonly... 50%. That doesn't mean it has to be. And you or your attorney should be mindful to carefully consider the fact, the law that allows unequal distribution of your assets and your debts. So let's look at some of the considerations that you're supposed to consider when dividing equitable distribution. And you're going to see a lot of these are similar to the alimony um, factors, which are going to be significant when we cover those because they've recently modified the alimony statute. And in some ways, in, in a methods that or manner that has affected small business owners or, or any business owner, large or small. So let's look at the, the first ones we have here for equitable distribution. This slide we have the duration of the marriage, the physical and emotional health of both parties, the income or property that's brought into the marriage by either party, standard of living during your marriage, any written agreements that may have existed, may exist or have existed, economic circumstances, and the income and earning capacities. Now, real quick, under income and earning capacity, there's several different things that courts will look at. Educational background, training, employment skills, work experience, length of absence from the market, and custodial responsibilities. This, Now, this, again, this is only the first portion of the, the equitable distribution statute, but let's talk a little bit about 
the law that surrounds these factors before we really get into all the, the nuts and bolts of the business issues. First of all, marriage duration, very important consideration, and it relates significantly to the standard of living, which you see three factors down. Marriage duration is important because, um, especially under the new alimony statute, the law now says that alimony cannot, if, if the marriage is less than 20 years, alimony cannot be longer than the term of the marriage. Now, the duration of the marriage will also impact the distribution of assets and whether or not there should be equal or unequal distribution because you have a lot of factors that the duration of a marriage can influence. The longer the marriage, more likely the, fluct the greater fluctuations in the value of assets. Doesn't necessarily mean that they always go up, doesn't necessarily mean they always go down, but there's going to be large fluctuations. There's going to be significant contributions, both marital and financial, in and out of this um, circumstance the longer the marriage is. Conversely, you may have certain spikes that occur. You may have a person who um, spent 15 years developing a business and was single at the time, gets married, and the next year the business takes off. And we'll talk about this a little more when it comes to uh, factors of, about momentum. But if these are things that happen that you need to contemplate so that you don't walk into having a judge say, well, it's 50-50. It's uh, age and physical, emotional health of the parties is kind of self-explanatory. Income or property brought into the marriage. This is important because a lot of businesses are going to be premarital businesses. And even if they're started at the time of marriage, there's often a lot of premarital contribution, both financial and personal. You may have work experience or, or education, special education that you acquired before you got married that facilitates opening this, opening this business. And it's a factor that a lot of people don't consider when determining whether or not a business is marital or premarital. Um, standard of living, important again, as I mentioned, you know, the greater focus is now going to be under the new alimony statute, but what kind of standard of living did this business provide for both of the parties? Fortunately, the law, the alimony law, again, um, has changed in that it indicates that neither party is entitled to a better standard of living than the other, or at least the standard of living is both parties are entitled to try to maintain a comparable standard of living in the past. The focus had always been on the lower earning spouse's needs, and uh, the focus has now changed where they're recognizing that you can't, if one person is given enough to maintain a comparable lifestyle, that often leads the person who's paying it not to be able to live that lifestyle. So the new laws require that the courts create a greater balance, which is better if you're going to be the um, income paying spouse. And most of the content of this webinar is through the focus or belief on my part that the person that owns a business is also likely to be an alimony candidate or the larger earning spouse, because that is most often the case. So if you have a unique situation where for some reason, maybe you're not, you have a small business and, and your, your spouse earns significantly more, a lot of this information may not necessarily fit your situation. You, you may want to just email me if you have any special circumstances that I should be addressing for you. Written agreements, pre- and post-nuptial agreements. Pre-nuptial is, you know, most people are probably aware of the agreement beforehand. Um, even if the business does not exist before the marriage, you may have provisions in a prenup that provide for what would happen if, it, if you do start a business. It will also determine how alimony is addressed. Um, if you have premarital assets going into your business, prenup would usually um, determine or describe it, whether it's protected or not and how your business gets divided. Post-nuptial agreements, and I think there's a spot in here later that we talk about it again, um, are agreements made after the marriage. Um, most people aren't familiar that such a thing exists. They're, they're sometimes called separation agreements. Um, the current status of the law suggests that they are not the best agreements to have, a post-nuptial agreement. They consider them very coercive. I disagree, but right now I'm not making the law, so I have to follow it and tell you what it is. But they deem those agreements to be very coercive because they deem them to be sort of a um, sign this or I'm going to divorce you. They consider that more coercive than a prenup, which is sign this or we're not going through the wedding. I disagree. I think it takes more to go through a divorce. So I think people are less likely to follow through on a threat like that than to call off a wedding. But um, who knows? Economic circumstances of the party, obviously that's going to be different by every circumstances. Uh, the economic circumstances, possibly even of the nation or the economy, is going to be important when evaluating a business interest. 
you know, up until recently, people who were independent real estate agents or mortgage brokers, um, the courts were uniformly recognizing that they were in depressed markets and that their businesses were devalued significantly because, the, you know, there just wasn't business there anymore. Um, and that happened, you know, relatively quickly. I mean, I'm sure it developed over time, but the, it appeared quickly and the differences that people experienced happened rapidly. Income and earning capacities. Now, I'm not going to walk through each one of these. They're sort of self-explanatory. They become important because one issue when there is a business small, and again, most of my content tonight is also going to surround around small businesses, um, not large corporations or even large businesses, but it's still largely applicable. But when there is a, a small business, there's usually going to be an issue of imputed income, which we'll also talk about um, in the future when it comes to the alimony terms. Imputed income is the increase of one person's income beyond what that person is actually either receiving or bringing home. It's intended for somebody who is underemployed and has no good reason for it. So if, let's say, a physician who is making a half a million dollars a year quits his job, starts pumping gas at minimum wage, the court's going to say, well, we're going to impute your income at $500,000 for support purposes, whether or not you're in fact making it. Your support will be based on that number. No imputed income when it comes to small businesses can go both ways. Um, the courts could impute income to a small business owner um, for issues like perks or cash, which you know we'll get to also in greater detail shortly. But they can also for the, the lower earning spouse if that person is capable of earning more than he or she is at the time of your divorce. Let's look at some of the other Equitable distribution, fact, equitable distribution factors that you will be considering. Contribution to education or earning power of the other party, that is often called re reimbursement alimony. If you supported the other spouse in obtaining a higher degree or specialized education or occupation, and that person is generating more income than they would have without it, you're often entitled to a reimbursement alimony claim for that contribution, which if you're Owning a small business that is subject to equitable distribution may be a way to offset the um, the value of it or the purchase price for purchasing the your spouse's um, marital portion of it. Contribution of each party to marital property, again, hopefully self-explanatory. Um, if the if you have a business that was started, the courts will look at who started it, what were the initial investments into this, uh, both financial and non-financial, who worked the business, was there sweat equity. Um, did one spouse stay home and take care of the children to help the other one work more, things like that. Tax consequences of distribution, there's sometimes going to be capital uh, – well, there may be capital gain issues. Usually there's not many tax consequences to transfer of assets in a divorce because the asset transfer in a divorce is usually tax-free. But what you need to consider are the future tax consequences to the distribution that's occurring now, like will there be capital gains taxes? Are there going to be – State plan or state tax issues for the um, the children of the relationship. So there's a lot of future tax consequences um, that get considered an equitable distribution. When it comes to a small business, I think most of the issues are going to be income tax and possibly capital gain and I guess depreciation. Depreciation um, we'll discuss a little bit when it comes to alimony, but these are mainly the the um, tax consequences of distribution of a small business that you need to be aware of or that the courts will consider. The present value of the property, often businesses will be evaluated by an expert so that we can ascertain what it's worth, both if it was pre and post marital. Needs of the parents with custody to owner occupy marital residence. Obviously a specific issue we won't talk about with the purpose of this. Debts and liabilities, but debts and liabilities are normally just of the parties. If there's a debt and liability to the business, it's only going to be for the purpose of valuation of it. But Sometimes there's kind of a spillover. You might have a personal guarantee. You might have a very small business, it's like an like electrician who's working out of the house, and you know some of the bills are kind of both, and it's a little blurred which is which. Um, needs of creation of trust funds, again, usually for children, college, um, children with special needs, young children. Um, there could also be ways to avoid significant tax burdens like capital gains you can spread out sometimes by trust planning extent of deferral of career goals that usually goes to what's considered non-financial contributions marital contributions like raising a family leaving your job um, which we'll go into also 
more of alimony, but again, as a small business owner, likely going to be the one who's possibly responsible. And then the last that you always will see in statutes, other factors deemed relevant. So if there's anything that is unique that the court should consider, it will be determined. Those provisions don't often come into play, but they're there just in case of, you know, the um, special circumstances require. So let's turn to the meat of asset distribution, pre and post marital. Um, and then we'll turn to active and passive. Pre and post marital sounds like um, it's easy to figure out. Property owned prior to the marriage is not subject to equitable distribution. Exceptions. Assets purchased in anticipation of marriage, enhancements of premarital assets using marital funds, property purchased with premarital funds for the purpose of remaining property, party sole property is still considered premarital. So let's look at these first. Assets purchased in anticipation of marriage. Now this is an issue that often comes up, but not properly, because I think the way to properly do it is the divorce complaint needs to mention that you're going to consider the premarital portion of the relationship for equitable distribution. This usually applies to situations where the parties cohabitated for a significant period of time before marriage and lived in a marriage-like relationship, had children, maybe shared names, um, joint bank accounts. The, the intention was to act as a family. They held themselves out as a family. So if you say, for instance, the most common example is you, you buy a house together and six months later you get married. Or you had a child and, you know, your child was three and you bought a house. And then three years after when the child was six, you, you know, you got married. Well, those six years you were living like a family. You also contributed to the acquisition of the house, the, the payment of the house and things like that, which we'll talk about more when we get to active and passive. But you contributed to this asset, even though you weren't technically married. Courts will look at that as an exception to premarital um, division or protection of premarital property. Enhancement of premarital assets using marital funds. If you had, for instance, you owned a house before you got married or a small business, since that's our topic, and you get married and then your spouse contributes money that she had that was premarital into helping you grow your business. Well, her premarital monies would have been protected, but she put it and she put it into what would have been a premarital asset of yours. Now you've taken premarital assets and you've put a marital component because it would be unjust for somebody to contribute money that was protected to an asset and then not be able to divide its future value. With this additional caveat that per property purchased with premarital funds with the purpose of remaining separate is still considered premarital. This is a little hard because it, it's a blurry distinction. Most of the time, if you want to protect a premarital asset with when you're contributing during a marital time, you really need some documents to, to evidence that. Like, And I'm going to go off topic. If you're going to buy a house, for instance, and you are putting in premarital money and you want to make sure that it's protected, you should have something in the deed that indicates percentage of ownership. That's a little tricky in the beginning of a relationship or a new marriage when – you don't want to seem like you're protecting assets when you just get married, but you are. And unfortunately, if you don't, you may lose the separation. And in the case of small businesses, as we'll talk about soon, that's a very, it can be very important, very significant um, loss. So now uh, uh, other assets obtained during marriage are also regarded as marital property. There's a couple of things in here to also realize if you take, premarital assets and you commingle them, you share their names or account numbers, or you change the form of your business from um, a single member LLC and you put your wife as an LLC so that she can sign checks. You're now commingling what was a premarital asset, making it a joint marital asset. Creates issues if you don't have documentation to support it. Again, when we talk about the, the distinction of pre and uh, passive and active, it's going to be more important to understand how to manage and protect property throughout. Um, when you have issues like this, like for instance, when you're trying to purchase property with the intent of remaining sole property, this is where you might have the postnuptial agreement, the um, sometimes it's called a, a separation agreement. It's a lot easier to evidence intent to keep premarital property as your sole property, even when it's being 
commingled into marital assets with a simple agreement that says so. There are some exceptions to marital assets. I'm going to throw them in here just for a minute because I, I seem to be on time. So um, there are some exceptions to what are considered marital assets, even when acquired during the marriage. Um, inheritances, as long as they're kept in one party's name, the inheritance is not a marital asset. Property, uh, property, personal injury settlements are not marital assets, not subject to distribution. Workman's compensation claims typically are because they're a replacement for lost income, which is a marital asset. So this is important if, for instance, you open a business with inheritance or you had inheritance before you got married, you used it to open a business. Now you have premarital funds going into a marital asset. Very important to keep those distinctions clear. All right, let's turn to active and passive assets. This is probably the most important thing to understand. Um, and the concepts that I go through this in a moment with how the distinction can change from active to passive or passive to asset is important to, to focus on and also to realize that the premarital and postmarital distinctions also change in similar ways. So th this is a very important part of understanding how your business will be viewed. Active and passive assets. Active assets will increase an asset will be regard, or active increases in assets will be regarded as marital property subject to distribution. Passive increases will not. So what are they? An active asset is an asset that changes in value because of efforts and actual contributions, either contribution of efforts or financial contributions. A passive asset is an asset that changes simply because of market conditions. So let's talk a little bit about active assets first. The two most common active assets in a marriage are going to be a business and, and a house. So, for instance, with your house, now even if a house is premarital, and this is where we'll go a little into the distinctions, a house becomes more valuable because you make mortgage payments, so you pay off the loan. You put a new roof on in 10 years. You also raise a family in it and go to work. So you will increase the value. Now there is some increase by market condition, but most of the effort is considered, most of the increase is considered by the party's effort. A business similarly will increase in value by the effort and contributions of a party, both the efforts of the person working the business, as well as the spouse who may be supporting the other person by taking care of the family, taking care of the house, paying the home bills so that the other spouse is able to work. These are factors that increase the value of these kinds of assets. So active assets are increased by effort or contribution. Passive is increased by market fluctuation. So these are typically your retirement accounts, your investment accounts. Um, commercial property is considered passive um, because whether you work hard or not, you're not necessarily going to change the, the value of these accounts. Now, it may be different, for instance, if you were a day trader, but it's a topic for another webinar. So the, the problem here is that some things that are active and passive change and some things that are premarital and postmarital change. So let's say, for instance, you have a home that you own before you get married. Not so let's, let's make it a business. I, I keep going to home because it's so much more common, but to be on topic for the business owners out here. You want a business, you start a business before you get married. It's obviously a premarital asset. However, once you get married, your, your wife has several children that she raises while you're working long hours to support. Your business was premarital, but there is marital contribution both by her raising the family and there may be in times where your spouse works in your business. So, you're, pre, you're going to have a premarital portion and you're going to have a marital portion. It's often difficult to figure out the value at a certain point in time. You're not thinking when you're getting married to value your business, but after this webinar, hopefully you will be because it's important to know that. Passive assets similarly can change. Now, not as often and not as easy by the nature of these investments, but if you take a passive asset like a retirement account and you put money into a business 
you now have taken a premarital asset and, and made a, an active asset, which will change by contribution. Again, you may need to be able to track the money that was put into it as, as much as the value of something when you started it. Now, here are some of the problems. With, as, with active assets, for instance, you may have a spouse who works in the business that helps increase the business value. It's going to be impossible, not impossible, it's going to be very difficult to determine the value at the time of a divorce if you've been married for a period of time. For a, married, for a business that may have been premarital and subject to the premarital momentum that you develop, but then the spouse comes in and helps. Did the business take off because of the premarital momentum that you created, or did it become because of the spouse's contribution at running the business? It's hard to tell where the distinction blurs when it actually occurs. And then with passive, again, you know, the, the example I gave you, you contribute premarital assets where you commingle assets, you're changing the distinction. Um, most of the time you're making these decisions when things are good. So you're not really concerned about protecting assets or evaluating, or evaluating them. It's only years later when things some fall apart that you now have to determine when, what was the, the pension loan for and what account did it go into when we opened the business. It's sometimes hard to track what's actually been done several years earlier. But you're going to need to if you want to actually equitably divide the property that we're talking about, the business. So let's talk now a little bit about how it impacts alimony, because I, I generally think your, your two biggest concerns in a divorce will be evaluating the business for distribution, the buyout, and how it impacts income and alimony. So let's look at difficulty first, the difficulty with cash businesses. The, probably the most problematic issue to a divorce is a cash business. One, it's hard to document. Two, there's always cross allegations that one person's hiding and one person's dissipating. Um, but the first issue you're going to deal with in court is because of a case called Sheridan versus Sheridan, which will be thrown around all the time if you have a small cash business. Sheridan versus Sheridan was a case that held, technically the case held that if a party testifies to a crime, the court is required to report that crime to the prosecutor's office. Now, the issue of the case was the underreporting of significant amounts of income. So the facts of the case and the holding were sort of limited to, not limited to, but specific to the court having to report the underreporting of crime. So the basic holding that came out of this case was if a party gives testimony to either underreporting of income or any other tax related crime, the court is required to stop the proceedings, report it to the Internal Revenue Service, which would then usually trigger an audit and a freeze to all marital assets. Now, the, the thing I, I, I'm disturbed mostly about this case is that it only seems to be applied to the payment of taxes. While they sat on their lofty chairs and said, you know, judges have to report all crimes, they don't. For instance, if you have a abuse and neglect case against, you know, for an action against your child, you don't get reported for that. You only get reported if they think you hit income. And it's obviously financial incentive behind that case law. But that's my own soapbox for another day. So one thing is you have to realize if you have a small business and there is cash, you will most likely not be able to take it to trial. And both parties will learn that and it comes often a game of chicken, which spouse will give in first when you know you can't go to trial, which could be approaching. More often than not, the person who didn't run the business feels empowered by the fact that they were not uh, involved in it so they can claim to be innocent. But the long and short is generally when there's significant underreporting enough to not want to go to court, both parties either knew or should have known because the lifestyle would usually grossly exceed the tax return. So in most cases, both parties are going to be deemed culpable. Now, a problem that sometimes comes up is filing amended tax returns. If a party has an issue with underreporting income or they're concerned that there may be, they may be looking to amend their taxes. Now, the thing about taxes, and I always say check with your accountant before you do this, I believe that you can go from married, if you filed single, or I'm sorry, not single, married filing separate, you can go to a joint filing, but I don't believe you can go back. 
but there often becomes issues even post judgment when you have payment of alimony and there's cash businesses. But nonetheless, amending your tax returns is sometimes used as a tactic by parties because some married couples do file separate. Um, something you got to watch. Next, perks as income. Um, your small business owner will often have things like their car being paid, health insurance for their family, business travel, and you know meals and entertainment. Um, this is usually a way to minimize your income but maximize your lifestyle. Going back to the distribution factor we talked about, and we'll see now, money. So your perks, when you use perk, you use it often to reduce your income and your income tax. But in a divorce, what it ends up doing is it actually inflates your income because they sort of back it out and they add it back into your income. So now you're paying support off of money that you don't always have access to and you don't re receive on a regular basis. Imputed income. I touched on this basically when I first opened the equitable distribution issues. Courts may assign additional income for the purpose of calculating support. This is when they believe that a person is underemployed. So let's say you're running a business and you're not taking significant perks, but the income is either reported to be very low or you're simply not making that much because you're working a business because you, maybe you enjoy it or, or you, know, you don't want to give it up and go back to work for a W-2, but you're not making a lot of money. If you have the capability of making more by getting a job, the court's going to consider that you should be, in fact, looking for that job and closing your business. So if you want to stay self-employed, and making less than you might in a job, they're going to impute your income. They're going to assign additional income solely for the purposes of paying your support, even though you might not actually, in fact, receive that money. Um, one other quick point to look at when you talk about like person income, I'm not, I don't believe it pops up here. Certain things will also be backed out of your expenses, like I, I mentioned briefly. When they when your business pays for things like your car, um, your cell phone. Um, there's depreciation on on buildings and assets that those are all added back. So, like for instance, you know, you take a twenty thousand dollar depreciation deduction on your taxes, that gets added back into your income, and that's not actual money that you receive. It just reduces your tax burden. So, these things you need to scrutinize how your accountant, if you have an accountant, is filing your taxes and reporting your expenses before you file a divorce or evaluate your business because. You need to know what monies are going to be focused on for the purposes of your paying support. So let's look a little at alimony factors, additional things to look at. Social Security offsets I talked about. This, this is an issue that I've never seen anybody else raise but me. And I think it's, it's something very important, especially if you have a long-term marriage. You know, a lot of people focus more on your lifestyle and asset change. But a person who is self-employed is most often – paying themselves less because they're getting things like perks and depreciation and things like that. But at the time, you're not thinking about the fact that you're not developing a Social Security bank like the W-2 wage earning spouse that you may be related to. Now, I know there's some people who wonder whether or not there's going to be Social Security in our future or not, but that's not for us to discuss. A lot of people fail to realize that when a business owner retires – or close the business or whatever it should be, they're going to get significantly less Social Security than the other spouse. Now, my view is Social Security contributions are also a marital asset because they're acquired while you're married. They're put in through wages that are marital assets. So a spouse's receipt of Social Security benefits is due to your efforts enabling them to work. You need to look at, especially when you have a long-term marriage and you possibly have a long-term or significant alimony obligation, you need to look at what are the Social Security payments going to be as a, a way of maybe reducing or minimizing your support obligations. Second, and this is most important, future modifications. One of the greatest problems a self-employed individual encounters is the need to modify his or her support obligations post-judgment or, or after your divorce is entered. Now, there, there's something called an anti-Lepis clause. That came from a case, Lepis versus Lepis, which talked about maintaining the marital standard and a significant change of circumstances in the future allowing for a modification. More often than not, you'll have a divorce case that settles. And more often than not, in your settlement agreement, you'll have an anti lepis clause. You'll have a clause that says, we're agreeing to alimony, can't be changed for any reason. 
And people just think, well, that's great because they want to get divorced, they want it over with, or they things are good and everybody thinks things are going to stay good. And then things turn bad and they need to change your agreement. But an anti lepus clause prohibits you from doing that. So what I strongly recommend to all of my self-employed clients is when you're negotiating, what you want to negotiate and what's important to negotiate for you uh, I'm getting a message that there's no volume. Are you able to hear me? Somebody type if you can hear me. Uh, I'm not seeing any messages. Can somebody type into the panel just to make sure that there's... Okay, it seems you've been back. Okay, so... All right, so going back to um, what I was saying... Um, I hope you didn't miss the part where I talked about anti lepus clause. Um, but the important thing to take from that is what you want to negotiate is a clause that allows for a trigger if your business goes down or closes. Normally, and it's a little different now because the alimony statute, which I'll talk about in one second, change it. But normally, even under the new alimony statute, when you file or when you have a change of circumstances and you need to modify your support, you have to file a motion with the court after waiting, I think it's three months. You have to wait three months where your obligation either has to be paid or you're in arrears. You file an application asking for a modification. That takes a month to be heard. When you're heard, if you're successful, and it's hard to be successful because you need to show that over those three months you did every single thing you could to look for another job. If you do that in three months and your motion is successful, all you get is a trial six or 12 months in your future to determine whether or not your obligation should be reduced. It's sort of like a mini divorce. So you'll have six or 12 months that you're supposed to be paying. Sometimes you get a temporary reduction. Sometimes you don't, but you continue to be under the burden of this obligation and spending a ton of money that you don't have because you can't make your support. What I normally advise my clients going back to the point I was trying to make is to negotiate that in the event, the business dries up for, through no fault of your own, that the other spouse consents to putting the term of the change of circumstance modification to arbitration or mediation. Arbitration, I think, is better because mediation doesn't force an outcome. Arbitration is good because you usually get either an experienced attorney or a judge who retires to make your decision. It's much quicker, cheaper, and faster. And what you really need when your business is dried up and you have significant alimony and child support obligations is a fast resolution. So the point to take from that is, if they're asking for a lot of alimony or alimony amount greater than you're considered, considering giving, consider giving it to them if you get this provision in return because I guarantee you it is something that will make a life-changing difference when you have a problem, if you have a problem in your future. The next thing to consider is your self-employed party with involuntary reduction of income. The new alimony laws, fortunately, created provisions for self-employed individuals that didn't exist before. One of the, and it, it, part of it is that they talk about how to look at income and certain factors to consider. And also, it shortened the time by which you needed to wait for anybody to make a modification for support. So like I was saying a moment ago, it's three months. It used to be six months. So And that was, again, it was six months before you even got the court and then another six or 12 before you were hurt. So now you're two years behind. So take the, the change in the alimony statute, couple it with putting in a provision that says, in the event your business tanks or significantly decreases that you go to arbitration will be great protection for a small business owner and the significant changes that are going to come up. All right, let's turn to, I'm just going to touch on this issue a little bit here. Lack of marketability discount. Um, what we have here, and I'm not going to talk much about that is because this is just the law about, marketability of discounts some of it is when it applies the brown versus brown case explains what it is but the, the issue about marketability discounts in a divorce is, is very unique and very problematic for problematic for a small business owner the rest of the legal world says when you own a business you determine the value based largely on or, or one of the ways to determine would be on, on what the market will bear in the event that you have a small business or a sole proprietorship or a closely held business where it's like, you know, a mom and pop shop, 
the rest of the legal community basically says they give you a discount in the value of it because there's really no market for it. You know, if you're a one-man shop, you're an electrician, and you know your job is because you have a truck and your neighbors call you, nobody's going to buy that from you if you're not working the business. So there's really no marketability to that type of a business. Divorce law says that doesn't matter. There's no distinction for marketability whether you're a one-man shop. So if you have a one-man shop, you're an electrician and you're making $150,000. The court, a perfect example, I actually met with a client recently. His business, he's a painter. He's a one-man shop. He paints. He's got clients for because he's been doing it for like 10, 15 years. Pro business owns nothing except for maybe a client list. His income, I believe, was maybe 150 a year, which is a good income, especially as a one-man painter. You have to really hustle to bring that kind of money home. His business was valued at $250,000, and he has to pay his wife. In 90 days, and this wasn't my case, I, he came to me after he got this decision post-judgment. So trust me, I, I would have done everything to keep him out of this. But he was ordered to pay his ex-wife in 90 days $112,000 for her share of this painting business. The business has d no value in reality. But in the divorce law, under the current law, it doesn't matter. There's no lack of marketability discount. And most divorce lawyers that you talk to will probably tell you that they disagree with that being correct. But it is the law. It's what we have to follow. So if you're a small business owner and you're either in a divorce or getting married and considering like a prenup, that's something you really need to consider is how to determine or how to agree upon valuing the business so that you get a, a real evaluation and you get what the market will actually bear. Because another problem that comes up in here is you will often need to borrow significant funds in order to pay that share. For instance, let's go to this client who just came to me yesterday with this horrible judgment. He's going to borrow $112,000. Because he's going to have to service that kind of loan, his income is obviously going to be reduced because he's got to use his income to make these payments. But for alimony purposes, the court will consider what his income is currently. So even though he's got to take, let's say he's paying $2,500, you know, $30,000 a year in payments to pay this loan back, he has $30,000 less money to spend. Courts do not reduce his income by $30,000. His income is still the same. So he pays support based on the income that existed when the business was full, even though the business is servicing debt and your income drops. So without addressing marketability before either you're in a prenup or in your negotiations, you're going to have significant, significant problems managing buying your business because you're going to have to buy the asset. Another unfair aspect is, you can't just order it to be sold necessarily. It's your livelihood. And you can't say, well, let the spouse buy it because the other spouse can't work it. So you're stuck taking this asset, buying it for, in the example I gave you, $112,000. That might even be worth it to you that much. But you can't just quit it because then you go back to the imputation of income. And like the painter that I keep talking about, for instance, will be imputed at $150,000 of income. Nobody's going to pay him that to work for them. So he's got to keep this business to get the income to pay his alimony, but he's got to borrow $112,000 against his future income to pay for it. It's horrible if you don't plan properly, and if you're not aware of it before you go in, it's even worse. To talk a couple minutes on some just small issues to understand how values are considered and change. You have momentum and non-financial contributions. Two of the probably the most important issues that come up, both in alimony, but also in the valuation of a small business. Momentum. Momentum of the marriage, here's the uh, judge's quote, is the fruits of the party's joint effort during their partnership have not ripened into a proven ability to earn substantially high income than he or she ever earned during the marriage. The momentum is what I touched on before. kind of cuts both ways. Sometimes you have momentum that is pre- and post-marriage. If you're working for 10 years when you're married and you start a business from scratch and you know, you're working it out of your basement and 15 years later – it's a viable, healthy, strong business. That's momentum. Even if you're working it for 15 years while you're married and you're not making any money, the next year you do make money. The year after you get divorced, you make money. That's going to be considered marital effort because it came from the momentum of the marriage. The second is non-financial contributions. This is commonly, typically going to be the stay-at-home spouse that raises a family, um, that spouse may or may not work, but even if they're working, they're still usually taking more of the house and child-related um, responsibilities on so that the other party can dedicate their time to building 
this business up. These both of these issues are are difficult issues when it comes to valuation and alimony because momentum can be post uh, pre and post marital, um, and most often it is because again sometimes you have just your educational background. Like let's say for instance you're an attorney, you're working for a firm. When you get married, if you open your own practice, it was the experience and the education that you had long before your marriage that enabled you to do it. You couldn't open one without it. But that's usually not considered by people when they're determining equitable distribution because, like I said in the beginning, they don't use the factors. Non-financial contributions, not much planning you can do around that. It's, I have it there just so you understand that it's, they're going to look at it. Some people are going to say, my, my spouse didn't do anything for the business. They just stayed at home. Well, that's, that's non-marital contributions. That's non-financial contributions because that enabled you to stay at work. One caveat, and it's common in divorces, but it's hard to convince a divorce judge to look at it. And that is where you have the non-financial contribution from the spouse actually be a detriment to the business. You'll have the stay-at-home spouse that refuses to get a job when finances are tough, that requires daycare even though he or she doesn't work or doesn't work a lot, spends more money than they need to, requires or utilizes the perks of the business in, in a greater share than maybe the owner of the business would like to, it strains the business basically. Um, you would think if you had a spouse who was draining the business by a high lifestyle that equitable distribution would say, well, then that person should get less because the business suffered because of that. But usually it's just the contrary if you don't plan and negotiate properly because you allowed that person to live like that. It goes back to the lifestyle that you shared, the, the marital lifestyle. You allowed your spouse to not work and have daycare and, and spend money and get business perks. Comparable lifestyles suggest you may need to continue that. So while you're getting married or while you're married and these issues are rising or while you're planning to get married, you need to consider how this is going to play out in your long term. So how can you possibly do that? Some solutions. One, the easiest way is getting a business evaluation or a forensic account prior to the marriage. I, I know, again, people are going to say, and most often I get this when people talk about a prenup. Well, you know, they don't want to do this. They think we're planning for a divorce, blah, blah, blah. My, my opinion on, on getting valuations and prenups and things like that is it's the best time to do it before you're married because you care the most about one another. You should know the most about one another. Um, but don't be confused that protecting yourselves, both of yourselves in the beginning, may help you stay married because you have a better sense of what is going to occur. You have a better sense of how people are living, how you will live, what the business is worth, what it does. Nothing wrong with getting an evaluation beforehand. It also may help for tax and estate planning. Um, one thing that small business owners usually need to look at is Successive succession planning, what's going to happen to business in their absence, what's going to happen when you have children. Plenty of reasons why getting a business evaluation in the beginning before you get married is a great idea. I think it would actually help both the business and the family financially and uh, maritally. Post-marital, you can do uh, – you're still doing an evaluation. You can get an evaluation really anytime. You technically, don't even need to let your spouse know. Um, you could also do a post nup as I, I talked about a few times, an agreement to what would happen in the event of a divorce. You can get one that just, just agrees to what the value of the business would be. Um, anything that you do, whether the business valuation or a, a pre post nuptial agreement, will reduce your uncertainty in your future. And, and basically what you want to do, the hardest thing about getting divorced the reason why most people don't get divorced so quickly is because they don't know what to expect in their future. So doing these things, taking the consideration that we talked about throughout this um, planning is going to help both of you. It's going to minimize your cost. It's going to minimize your stress and give you a much fairer outcome, an equitable outcome, which is why they call it that type of a distribution as opposed to equal. That, I believe, is the end of my presentation information. I'm going to open up, see if anybody has posted any questions. Um, I don't see any. I'll give you another minute or two if you want to quickly post any questions that may have arisen, Rose, while, while we were here. Take a sip of water while we do that. Going once. 
twice. All right, I'm not seeing any. I'm going to close this down in two seconds. If for some reason when we uh, disconnect, if you come up with a question, you should have my email address because you would have gotten some kind of confirmation once you registered. Um, if not, real quick, it's, it's right here on the bottom, info at MickleLawGroup.com. You can also send directly to me at Brad, B-R-A-D, at MickleLawGroup.com. Otherwise, I hope you have a good night. I hope you enjoy your holidays, and hopefully I will see you next month. I believe our seminar next month is going to be the top 10 things an accountant needs to know about a divorce, but it's going to really be information that everybody should need to know about taxes and tax returns and a divorce. So with that, we wish you a good night and happy holidays.